Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, kick start with uh, actually the focus of our uh, first part of the show, and this is uh, the luxury sector. And I'm very happy to bring to the show Sweeter Ramach and Tran, Investment Manager at GAM. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I was just talking about um, the Hong Kong protests and Hong Kong is extremely important for the luxury sector in China as a whole. Is this something that concerns you? Uh, certainly, it hasn't been helpful for sentiment. And Hong Kong, as a percentage of global luxury sales, is roughly about 4% to 5%. So in itself, it's not critical because it's not so much the Hong Kong consumer that's consuming in Hong Kong, but actually the mainland Chinese consumer who comes over on holiday. So what's obviously happening is that that consumer is being disrupted. Those travelers are staying at home. And some of that spend is actually being repatriated back onto mainland China. Now, what this is affecting disproportionately is um, brands like hard luxury watches. Uh, Hong Kong is a very important watch market. So it's likely that not all of the watch demand in Hong Kong will get repatriated back to China. Um, and other companies, there are certain companies that have a bigger presence in Hong Kong than they do in mainland China because they simply don't ha have enough stores yet in mainland China. So those companies will be affected. But on the whole, as late as Q2 results, we had companies like Hermes and LVMH report. And when we asked them about the impact of the Hong Kong protests, they all said that they, didn't, uh, they hadn't noticed them yet in their numbers. I would like to start actually with um, some data and numbers. We all always start uh, from the numbers. You envision a compound annual um, growth rate of the luxury sector between 5 and 6%, which is in line with the last 20 years' growth. Uh, I mean, in the middle of a trade war and also products that are almost getting into four uh, months of products and, and actually everyone was hoping that the products are going to be over when students start a school again, universities and so on, but it doesn't look so. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, which are the basis of your um, analysis that is going to be between 5 and 6% the growth of the luxury sector? Sure. So over the long term, you're correct to say that the luxury goods sector has delivered demand growth of 5 to 6% in the last 20 years. Obviously, what's passed does not necessarily have to happen again in the future. However, there are a few uh, very uh, compelling factors that lead me to believe that luxury demand can be very resilient and even robust in the medium to long term. A uh, few among this are firstly the rise of the emerging middle class. There's a secular thematic that's extremely powerful. Every second, five people are estimated to join the global middle class. 70% uh, of the new additions to the middle class are from Asia. Uh, and it, it, these consumers who are entering the middle class have a higher propensity to consume, particularly luxury goods, than people who are already in the middle class. So seeing what we know about the trajectory of economic growth, particularly led by Asia, uh, we can identify a source of demand from these new consumers that are entering the market. Market. Um, secondly, we can't underestimate the importance of the millennial and Gen Z consumer cohort to driving industry demand. Uh, collectively, millennials and Gen Z make up about a third of industry demand right now, but they actually contribute to over 80% of growth. Uh, millennials and Gen Z consumers are much more, uh, have a higher propensity to consume luxury goods because they've grown up in an era of brands as well as social media, and all of that predisposes them to more familiarity with these brands which historically we simply didn't have access to the information about. Um, I think another really relevant factor for the growth of luxury in the longer term is also the impact of digitization. This is a sector that has been much slower than other sectors to adopt online. Uh, luxury brands have had a very aloof relationship with the internet, believing it to be um, you know, not exactly core to their uh, ability to service customers. The new generation of customers doesn't have very clear distinctions between offline and online and is looking for luxury uh, conveniently where they can find it. And I think that will allow luxury brands to tap into a new consumer uh, at a lower cost. And if we focus on Asia, I'd like to talk about Beijing, which uh, have been extremely strong and powerful city in terms of luxury. But um, from economic point of view, China is definitely uh, fading away. I mean, uh, and also the outlook is not really positive. Do you expect a new city to be the, how can I say, the leading power of the luxury sector or is it still going to be uh, Beijing or Hong Kong or China as a whole? 
So the beauty of China is it's obviously 1.2 billion people, currently 400 million of whom are in the middle class. Uh, and clearly all of these middle class consumers in China are not just in Beijing, they're quite well spread across the spectrum, all the way from tier one cities down to the tier five and tier six cities. So I think the great appeal of China is that this 400 million plus uh, middle class consuming class today is expected to increase to 600 million just within the next five years alone. And they will be quite well spread out throughout the country. So I don't necessarily see one city such as Shanghai or Beijing be particularly important for luxury goods, but that it's the middle class across all the different cities in China, uh, and even not cities, perhaps even villages, who are able to access these brands online, who will be the consumers of the future. And what about Hong Kong? Because actually, I should point out that companies such as Montclair or LVMH um, uh, said that uh, the rallies, the protests are hurting their quarter results, especially Montclair. Uh, I mean, are you concerned about that? Because um, as I was just saying, malls, railway stations, airports, all of them were affected. And as a consequence, we do see that also the tourism is getting lower and everything. I mean, is this something that you are thinking about and is this something that is going to have a bigger impact than you have expected? So Hong Kong is about 4% of luxury, global luxury demand on average. And clearly the people who are consuming in Hong Kong overwhelmingly are the mainland Chinese. So what's happening now is that they're reducing their travel to Hong Kong, but are repatriating their consumption back to the mainland. Now in a lot of cases, as you correctly identified, it won't be a one for one substitution. Um, Montclair, one thing to point out is Q3 is actually a very small quarter for Montclair. Because of the seasonality in their business and the fact that they sell winter wear product, um, uh, this uh, July to September quarter is only 10% of their sales. So I think they will be more disrupted because they have fewer stores in China than their peers and therefore the lost demand from Hong Kong may not necessarily be made up in the short term in their mainland Chinese stores. Uh, over the long term, I do expect this to sort of wash out as consumers change their consuming patterns. We've seen this also with, for instance, Chinese uh, travelers who are traveling less to the U.S. but are continuing to consume U.S. brands just back at home in China. Exactly. I wanted to talk about a trade war. What about a trade war? I mean, it certainly has enormous impact here in Europe on the European economy. Only today we saw European macro data that was really, really delusional. Uh, what, what does it mean for the luxury sector, the, the, the sector, the trade spat between the U.S. and China? So I think what's interesting about the luxury sector is the second half of last year is really when we saw the sentiment around the trade war heat up. And that's when the macro wars really started to accelerate and people were very concerned about the luxury sector as a consequence of what happened. Um, and, and in fact, what happened in the second half of last year was that the sector's fundamentals remained extremely resilient. So the fourth quarter of last year, Louis Vuitton grew its fashion and leather goods segment by 17% at a time when people thought the world was basically, you know, kind of imploding. So the underlying fundamentals are showing somewhat of a disconnect with the macro noise and the news flow around the trade war. And some of that can appear a bit perplexing from the outside, uh, but I would point to the fact that what it's really alluding to is the fact that there is this younger consumer that is consuming luxury for the first time. So it's not a case of a mature consumer who has basically uh, used this trade war as a reason to, to consume less. It's really a new wave of consumer that's coming on stream that doesn't necessarily uh, see the impact on their lifestyles yet in order to change their purchasing patterns. I would like to talk about a topic that um, people are not talking a lot and of course I'm talking about a contemporary artwork. Many critics and analysts have warned about a bubble in the market of contemporary art. Do you fear this bubble will burst? I think uh, contemporary art goes through a period of bubbles periodically. We last saw the bubble burst in 2008 with the global financial crisis. Um, from the point of view of investing in the luxury sector, it's almost an irrelevance because that contemporary art bubble is fueled at the top by a very small number of people. Uh, so in terms of its wider impact on, on the luxury sector and demand for you know, a Louis Vuitton handbag or a Cartier bracelet, I would say it's, uh, it's practically irrelevant. 
And um, let's talk about the millennials and their impact on the luxury sector because they simply want to, to use the goods that are buying for a very limited period of time. They're not really attached to them. Um, I should say we share, I count myself for a millennial, we share everything like clothes, cars, uh, everything, mom pads. Um, so, I mean, can you elaborate on how the millennial changed the luxury sector and the luxury business? Because, of course, many brands are adopting their strategy on actually exactly on the tastes of the millennials. Certainly, as a generations change and newer consumers come on stream, uh, the business models of these companies will evolve. Uh, what I would caution, though, is that millennials are not necessarily identical around the world. So there's a big difference, for instance, between Chinese millennials and their Western counterparts. Um, in China, 70% uh, of millennials own their own homes. So essentially, all of their income effectively is disposable income. This is a very different situation from a US millennial who in a large, uh, a large amount of cases has college debt that they need to work off uh, and perhaps not as much financial flexibility due to the lower home ownership than their Chinese counterpart. Um, around the world, you're right that there is a trend for millennials to participate more in the circular economy and the sharing economy, but actually what we're seeing is the Chinese millennials have very different consumption patterns from their Western counterparts. So in the US, for instance, I think millennials have an appetite for luxury, but perhaps not the ability to consume it to the same extent as their Chinese counterparts. But what's emerging are new business models to cater to this millennial consumer. So we're seeing luxury rental models such as Rent the Runway uh, come, uh, come, come about. Uh, another example of a luxury resale platform that's selling secondhand luxury to American consumers is a company that recently listed called The Real Real. So, Millennial consumers do have an appetite for luxury, perhaps not the same ability to consume it, and that's why these new business models are emerging. Um, in terms of what you said about millennials valuing experiences over things, it's interesting that that has been kind of the conventional wisdom now that we've adopted for the last three or four years. But actually, over that same period, millennials have fueled two-thirds to now about 80% of the luxury industry's growth. So they may say that they value experiences over things, but they're actually still going out and buying that Gucci handbag um, or the Cartier bracelet, whatever they might say. And I think maybe one of the ways to square these two opposing positions uh, is by considering that millennials are also avid users of social media, and Gen Z in particular, and showcasing an experiential luxury lifestyle on social media is one way in which they say they value experiences over things, but actually their purchase of things has not declined in, in that period. Exactly, and, and you mentioned once again um, Chinese millennials that are able to afford more actually and, and, and younger at, at a younger age compared to their, how can I say, Western counterparts. I mean, once again, is the Chinese market the most important one? At present it is. So a third of the industry, a third of the demand for luxury goods worldwide presently is from China. But not just that, two thirds of the growth is from China. So the Chinese consumer is extremely important to the luxury industry for, at the moment. Exactly, uh, I guess so. Um, let's talk about the tech sector because we saw very huge mutations there only a few days ago, actually a little bit more than a week ago, Apple presented um, its new products and we saw a huge difference, not only the move from software and hardware to services, but also lower prices of the iPhone. Uh, which is really, I mean, significant because so far the iPhone have always, has always been a um, very expensive good. Uh, what do you think is this pivot, let's call it like that, to services and not only to cheaper iPhones? Do you think the market is oversaturated or are there different reasons like, for example, the trade spread between the United States and China? I'm sure it's a function of uh, very many different. I think you're right. Apple at its heart used to be sort of a luxury technology technology company with the hardware that it was providing. Oh, it still it is, by oh, the way. You're right, absolutely. There's no way you can argue a thousand dollar phone isn't necessarily a luxury. Uh, I think what has happened is competition in the smartphone market, especially at the high end, has heated up. And so the functionality, the incremental functionality that Apple has been offering um, has had to work a lot harder to keep up with its, uh, with its, with its competitors. Um, so in that sense, the pivot towards services is essential towards driving a more recurring revenue stream. Uh, and I think it's probably based on the view that the addressable market can therefore be widened by reducing the price points.
And, and do you think um, Europe is kind of lagging uh, behind the US in terms of um, high tech um, and luxury goods, let's call it like that? <laughs> I think Europe really does what cl classic luxury goods very well. In terms of high-tech luxury goods, I would actually argue that the barriers to entry there may not be as high as what Europe has traditionally been good at, which is founding these houses with incredible heritage, incredible provenance and stories and narrative. I mean, if you think of Hermes, which was founded in 1837, um, there's simply, you know, that barrier to entry that that company has built through the centuries of brand equity that it has accumulated uh, is not able to be disrupted in the short term. I'd like to ask you, do you think the luxury sector is going to continue to be our safe haven in these difficult times? I should say difficult times, especially from a geopolitical point of view, also economic point of view. I mean, it's a huge mess around the world. Do you think we have to, call to go to the luxury sector and focus on there? I think top line growth for the sector, there's a lot of visibility on the drivers of top line growth for the sector. Clearly there are short term disruptions here and there, but I would argue even throughout the 2008 and 2009 period, the luxury sector bounced back very quickly because of this powerful long term thematic, which is that of the rising emerging middle class consumer. So if we look at the long term and also the individual companies within the sector, uh, they're all, you know, they're very uh, cash generative, their return on capital is quite high, they're net debt, uh, their leverage is quite low, uh, and these are companies that are able to grow through a combination of organic growth or mergers and acquisition. So I think the combination of this plus high and growing margins means that this is an attractive sector over the long term for investors. Over the long term, not the medium. Uh, medium and long term. Great. And let me ask you one last question. Uh, According to the last data we got, um, the rich people are spending less money for luxury goods. And I'm not talking for, I mean, for, for cloth or iPhones. I'm talking also for, for cars, which are huge, and also for, for houses and so on. Do you, do you consider it as a warning? Because, I mean, at the end, uh, apart from the middle class, the rich people are the ones that are spending the most on luxury goods. Do you think this is something to be uh, worried about if you were LVMH or Gucci or Caring or whichever brand? I think just the wave of new consumers that's coming on stream, the 400 and odd million millennia, sorry, Chinese middle class households that are going to grow to 600 in the next few years, followed by a further you know, 400 million middle class households in India uh, and in other parts of Asia. I think there's so much growth that this industry still has to tap into. When we consider uh, rich people spending habits, some of that could just be a function of saturation. Perhaps there's, you know, they have, they've tapped out on their spending on luxury goods, but there is no shortage of new entrants to the luxury category, particularly in emerging markets. All right, thank you very much. Sweeter much and Ryan, Investment Manager at GAM. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, we're heading for a very short commercial break, but when we return, we're going to comment all the major stories, one of which is certainly Thomas Cook. And not only, we're going to delve deeper into the trade tensions between the United States and China. So stick around.